Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. April 16th, 2021. Here we are doing the weekend update on a Friday afternoon. Goldilocks markets or a wrecking ball of risk. You know it. You've seen it. Come on. The market grind continues to the upside. We're going to start this weekend's update with a uh, brief review of markets. Then we're actually going to talk a little bit about uh, how we're kind of positioning ourselves and uh, where we're actually seeing some opportunity in what has kind of amounted to uh, none other than, once again, a, uh, a bullish grind. In fact, that's exactly where I am going to start uh, this kind of weekend update here is discussing the bullish grind. You know what? It, uh, it takes looking at a daily chart in the S&P futures to really get a feel for this. I mean, uh, this thing is it's literally just straight to the upside. But a couple of aspects that kind of resonate over here. First of all, it's one of the most linear moves that we've ever seen inside of a major index product. And when I talk about like linear moves, you kind of think to yourself like only a machine could make such a straight, you know, inclination in the marketplace. But that's exactly what it is. It's just gamma ultimately squeezing us to the upside. And uh, again, very, you know, rudimentary hedging activity that's actually driving markets just incrementally. And that's what I talk about when the bullish grind goes on. If you missed last weekend's update, last weekend's update, I was actually telling you kind of like, you know, who buys the all time high? And the answer kind of lies in the fact that you don't necessarily have to be bullish to be buying the marketplace. I mean, plenty of market making firms. And again, and they just continue to kind of grind us a little bit higher. One thing, though, that is notable in here, both uh, options and futures, the volumes have declined and actually declined uh, quite substantially. For those of you that are like you know, a little bit of like option geeks out there, I mean, obviously you realize that some of the option volume has died out. But one of the things that I think is even more interesting is some of the uh, some of the volume here inside of the futures. This is a little bit easier to see than like looking at option volume. You know, option volume, I could talk about the number of contracts, you know, that have traded in 2021 and you know the average contract size every day is close to like 42 million contracts but we've been averaging day in and day out anywhere from 33 million to about 36 million but again that doesn't necessarily resonate with you so contract size is off between 20 and 25 percent in terms of uh just just this latest ascent the option okay volume kind of really calmed down but it's the uh, it's the futures that have me looking and i'll tell you why the futures you know, have me kind of engaged a little bit. If you take a look back at, um, at uh, again, what we're looking at as a daily chart here, this is nine months, but I zoomed in a little bit because I just wanted to show you again, the um, the most recent ascent. And again, the uh, the lower volume that has been pretty consistent over here. Like, listen, we're lucky. I had one day recently that we actually cracked over uh, 1.5 million uh, S&P futures contracts that actually traded uh, prior to that again in some chop trade okay what do you get I mean you should easily see 1.5 million contracts that has been the best day that we've seen recently so the uh, the reason that I bring this to your attention is that okay the only real movement in the marketplace all right is this kind of grind uh, but even the hedging activity is relatively light based on the liquidity and the well the volume that's trading through the S and P futures, and say what you will about the marketplace. Listen, for the S and P's to go up, for the S and P 500 to go up, for the S P X to go up. Okay, you need activity specifically inside of the S and P futures, and in this particular case, there's just not a huge amount of activity. You know, driving ultimately markets is the point that I'm trying to make over here. There's not a lot of depth behind the moves that we're seeing. Nevertheless, this move is from 3,900 okay, to almost 4,200, almost a 300 point straight ascent inside of the S&Ps. Now, okay, with that, the marketplace has also become incredibly all right, efficient throughout the course of this particular week of trade. And by that, I mean, well, with all due respect, if you are not in tune with expected moves, you should get in tune with expected moves. For those of you unaware, uh, what expected move happens to be. And again, I'll kind of delineate the expected move from this uh, this previous week of trade. What you're looking at, right? Right here, okay? That is actually last Friday's closing price, okay? This is an upper edge of the expected move and the lower edge of the expected move. Now, the expected move is derived, okay, 
solely from the option marketplace. Obviously, I've already got the next expected move for uh, for the forthcoming week um, already up here. Why? Well, because we just closed on a Friday afternoon. You can see, of course, next week. The point of this is, okay, what you're looking at kind of defines where that gamma risk is going to be throughout the course of a given week. And this, this again, previous week of trade, the week that we just passed through, the expected move was the equivalency of plus or minus just about 60 bucks and just rounding it to about $60. We literally came up and on this Friday uh, closed literally on it. And what's amazing about that, and again, I can show you time and time and time again, how many times we actually resonate right around the expected move. This is actually today's trading session. When I say today's trading session, this is actually the morning bell, the afternoon bell, this is Friday. We literally pulled up to the edge of the expected move, skirt of the expected move for the entire trading session, effectively closing right on it. Again, it's a little bit of, if you will, the efficiency of the marketplace that kind of resonates with us. And week in and week out, we've seen this a number of times. And actually the previous week prior to that, so now we're two weeks back, we actually went to the edge of the expected move. And again, we went to the edge of the expected move on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday broke outside of it. Uh, just because these lines are on your screen, that doesn't denote that you can't break above or below it. The reason though that I'm, I'm centering into this, okay, in a marketplace that's a bullish grind to the upside, okay, know that the upper edge of the expected move and or lower edge of the expected move could be a wonderful place to strategize around. Uh, specifically, there's a strategy that we use with expected move butterflies specific to the SBX where you can actually play kind of pin the tail on the donkey for, uh, for butterflies towards the end of any given week. And we've actually hit, and it's uh, again, quite, uh, uh, quite considerable number of times, again, recently, that we have, again, traded in and around the expected moves right to the end of the week. With uh, with that, moving on, again, a little bit more of a market update over here. One of the other aspects that I want you to see, so the SPX, in the previous, you know, two weeks ago, broke outside the expected move. This week just comes right to the upper edge of the expected move. So nothing wild, nothing crazy. But how did that compare, if you will, Okay, to expected moves on other index products and other sectors. So one of the things I like to do, you know, on these weekend updates, like this is the QQQ and you're like, oh yeah, the Qs, man, they've, they've been just ripping it up to the upside. So let's go look at what we call auto expected moves and auto expected moves, which are actually going to find in here, well, the QQQ technically underperformed the S&P in terms of hitting its expected move. So the Qs did not outperform this week. Let's go look at the IWM. The IWM, once again, underperforms. The IWM does a whole lot of nothing, okay? And the IWM has, it's just been wild lately. I am cracking through expected moves. This has been the, uh, the in, you know, the odd index product out in terms of uh, wild expected moves. You look at things like financials, financials, okay? Even they didn't necessarily perform. And you really have to kind of dig around here people like uh, let's well let's go look at the energy sector what did the energy sector do this week actually hit the upper edge of the expected move and then reverted back and lost all of that okay the energy sector finishing massively unchanged you start to look at like individual products you could look at like walmart again the auto expected move it's so much like it's an just an incredible like versatile tool in terms of trying to gauge you know what sector by sector is doing because Here's the question for you. If the S&Ps, okay, are actually finishing at the upper edge of their expected move, and yet our major sectors like the QQQ, the QQQ just, you know, again, it underperformed the S&Ps and the IWM underperformed and, you know, the XLF kind of underperformed the S&Ps, what drove us here, okay? And what's crazy about this, you start looking at like individual, literally individual like stocks, like Facebook underperformed over here and Apple like underperformed, okay? Here's one, Microsoft, Microsoft, but Microsoft is pretty much in line with QQQ. You can take a look at something like uh, Tesla, okay? And you're actually gonna find right here, okay? Right here, people, the overperformance of a lot of the S&Ps can in very broad, you know, very broad strokes over here is brought to you by, it's Tesla, all right? And I wanted you to see that because Without having to dig through the entire marketplace, I just wanted to, you know, go through a couple of different products and just get you to display, like literally now, you know, there's like one underlying that is capable of driving a marketplace. And again, if you go to this auto expected moves, you get a feel for that rather quickly. All right, so here's Apple, kind of an underperformance. Netflix coming into earnings next week, obviously Facebook underperforming. Uh, Amazon, 
you know, after having a, a banner week last week, just did nothing this week. I mean, this was kind of a sloptastic week. There's, there's nothing else to say. So what do you got? You got the performance of Tesla breaking through the upper edge of its expected move and taking the, uh, the S&Ps a little bit higher with it. So as I was saying, this is, you know, this Goldilocks marketplace or just a wrecking ball of risk. And as I kind of move on with that, when I think about like, you know, the Goldilocks scenario, the Goldilocks scenario is in very large part due to the Fed, right? And the fact that the Fed has gone out there and, you know, again, there's a lot of argument. The Fed has destroyed the market. They've done this, they've done that. Here's the one bottom line, okay? The Fed has actually held interest rates low indefinitely, which has actually made for what? The propagation of incredible amounts of risk. And when I talk about Goldilocks marketplace, you know, there's a, there's again, an interesting kind of almost like play on words in here. The Goldilocks markets create a wrecking ball of risk. Doesn't matter what you think about that. I mean, sooner or later, you know, if rates are ever to go back up, it becomes a wrecking ball of risk. But at this point in time, when I talk about the Goldilocks marketplace, which is this perfect scenario of jobs are being created, okay, there is a stimulus package out there. The Fed is going to keep rates low. They're going to continue to buy bonds. Everything is going to be okay, right? And if it's not, don't worry about it because they'll, they'll backstop it. But then you start to look at the bonds. And this is why I was actually thinking of that title. The bonds seem to be behaving, well, badly. Okay? And there's a lot actually of discussion on the bonds in this weekend's uptake because this has been kind of the epitome of what I've actually been trading a lot lately. You know, people ask like, what are you trading? I'm trading bonds. Okay, what are you trading? Bonds. Okay, what are you, you selling some option premium? Yeah, in the bonds. Why? When I say the bonds are starting to behave badly, first of all, the bonds, you almost feel like they've been out of the game and they have. Okay. The bonds all of a sudden have just been out of the game and continued to be out of the game until, well, two days ago on Thursday, the bonds exploded to the upside and then finished with the oh so handsome doji star. Anyway, I, I am not into the, uh, the Japanese candlesticks, but that's all right. So the bonds actually break to the upside. But why do I actually call this bonds behaving badly? By the way, you can look at bonds, you can look at notes, okay, and to your heart's content. Um, again, you'll see the ZN actually picked up a little bit and all of this is actually creating, again, a little volatility in the interest rate itself. The interest rate got up to about 1.7%, backed off to about 1.5%. With interest rates though backing off like they did, you would actually expect, okay, and I'm going to talk about the financials here in a second, but you would expect that the financials with interest rates backing off, the financials to see some sell side activity. They didn't. The financials actually did close at kind of their, their highs of, of the week. And uh, again, it was on the back of earnings, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. But the bonds are absolutely behaving badly. There was also several points in time throughout the course of this week. And you know what? I wasn't, uh, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm going to go ahead and bring up a chart. Okay. And the chart that I'm going to bring up, okay, as sloppy as this may look, the chart that I'm actually going to bring up, this is what I keep on my other screen. So I, I trade on multiple screens here. I'm going to keep my other screen and I'll, I'll go ahead and like kind of zoom in, zoom out of this so you guys can see. This is actually a chart of the ZB and this is a chart of the NASDAQ, okay? So let's just zoom in to portions of the trading day. What I wanted you to see is the uh, the high correlation between the uh, the ZB and the uh, and the NASDAQ throughout the course of uh, trade, uh, both in the pre-market and uh, during and throughout the trading day. But it's worth noting, and again, I'll, I'll spend some more time throughout the course of this next week here live on TheoTrade discussing some of the dynamics over there, but we did see some points in time where the uh, where the bonds saw some sell side activity and the bonds seeing sell side activity actually took the NASDAQ down quite considerably. As soon as the bonds though, and I'll just kind of go back and forth here, as soon as the bonds kind of mellowed out, yep, yeah, so did the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ was actually to propagate and uh, finish massively unchanged for the uh, for the trading day. So the bonds behaving badly has actually uh, sent of a, a kind of a good implication for me. So let's go over to the TLT for a second. Under the TLT, I'm going to go to a daily chart and then I'm going to cruise over to here. The um, I call this the implied volatility range. All right, what you're actually looking at on your screen in front of you, this is actually the um, kind of a chart of an IV rank. So this is an IV rank. Uh, take a look at the implied volatility rank. We're up you know, we're getting up there. It's, it's nice. So the implied volatility is considerably higher inside of the TLT, higher than what? If you took a look at like, uh, let's go to IWM in comparison. IWM is the zero ranking. And we talk about like IV ranking, right? And I don't, I don't want to spend all day on IV ranking because I personally, I don't think it's the end all be all for, for understanding implied volatility. But what IV rank basically says is like, 
IWM. Okay, the IWM, the implied volatility right now, is 23%. And the highest implied volatility in the last 52 weeks has been, okay, 56%. So what an IV rank does is it looks at the, the baseline, if you will, okay, and the upper, you know, uh, you know, hit of implied volatility throughout the last 52 weeks, and it kind of ranks. If we're all the way up here at 56, that's the hundredth, you know, ranking. And if we're all the way down here at 23%, that's the 0%. Right now, pretty much there. And if you're right smack in the middle of them, obviously that's kind of the 50th percentile. But the way that uh, the way this is calculated, it's much more of a rank than it is a uh, percentile. Nevertheless, the point that I'm trying to make over there is when uh, when all else fails, and the reason I'm saying bonds are behaving badly, okay, volatility is up inside of the bond product. Again, if you look at the IWM, the volatility kind of fell out of bed. QQQ volatility fell out of the bed. In the uh, S and P's volatility is down at the you know the one the one rank. It's uh, it's slow out there, right? Until of course you look over at the uh, the bond product and the bond product is rocking. And I actually believe that this is going to be the area of contention for the marketplace. It's simply not paying attention to it right now. Why should the marketplace pay attention to it? Because the bonds they're driving things like right now, like the Nasdaq. We just saw that in today's trading session. We saw that the last time that the bonds sold off, and I'll remind everybody. Because people forget short-term, you know, financial memory. The bonds selling off over here caused some fairly tumultuous volatility inside of the uh, the Nasdaq. People, the bonds are going to define the next move in the marketplace. Not only are the bonds moving the financials, the bonds are also, of course, moving the Nasdaq. And uh, it's all about the bonds. And the bonds are actually displaying, you know, inordinately high volatility versus the S&Ps. And, you know, if you're looking around, you're like, oh, man, those spiders. Take a look at the spiders right now. Their implied volatility, it's dead by dead, you know? <laughs> you can go further out in time. And the IV, the IV is actually decent out here. You go 91 days out, you got like 20% IV, which I'll give you right now is decent. You go to the QQQ, right? And the volatility 90 days out is like 24%. It's decent. It's, it's you know, you're still something to bite onto and sell inside of most of the index products, okay? But here's the interesting irony. If you go to the TLT, okay, the bond product, man, volatility, Okay, is just decent throughout. And again, you're actually seeing like bond volatility, TLT volatility in most cases higher than S&P volatility. And that's where I think there's a little bit of a catch 22 over there. Okay, and again, this is gonna be an area that you're gonna see me selling a, quite a bit of premium inside of the bond product. Um, just waiting for uh, some of the September contracts to really pick up and, uh, and start trading a little bit more actively inside of the ZB. With that, switching, uh, switching gears, okay? So with the bond product, of course, it was moving financials, except financials this week had earnings. And when I say financials had earnings, most of your financials, well, they had earnings, okay? Um, no other way to put this, but uh, like Bank of America, okay? So let's start to look at some individual products here. Bank of America. Absolutely stellar earnings in most of your financial products. Uh, JP Morgan doing absolutely nothing after earnings. Okay, the only one that actually broke to the upside is none other than Wells Fargo on the earnings announcement. For the most part, though, people, okay, this was just a, a complete slop fest. Uh, around the earnings. And I have to question now, when tech starts to release earnings, in fact, you're gonna have uh, the likes of uh, Netflix coming out next week. Maybe we see a bit of that uh, as well. Again, financials, they absolutely smoked earnings and then they just slopped around. It was an absolute non-event, which I have to tell you, if you listened to like last week's uh, you know video, I was actually talking about maybe we get a little surprise out of some of the earnings. I was looking towards like, you know, the Goldman Sachs out there and I could not have been uh, more disappointed, not in the earnings numbers. And again, push the earnings numbers aside because this is neither here nor there. It's the actual price action in the underlyings that was, you know, disappointing, disconcerting almost a little bit too because the volatility was just not there. So I started looking around. And the reason I brought this up, financial smoke earnings and then slop around, I looked around a little bit and uh, hey, sure enough, okay, you know, obviously, as I said, Netflix has earnings coming out. There is nothing stellar though priced into Netflix. You know, one of the things you look at is the implied volatility differential from like the seven day to the 14 day. Obviously that IV is gonna pick up. We're only looking at like at most a $40 expected move, okay? On what, you know, $550 product. And uh, this is an underlying that used to always have what? Mm, about 10 to 12%, meaning that the, uh, the move was usually priced for about 10 to 12% of the underlying price here, okay? We're doing nothing. It looks like it's gonna be a little bit more of a quiet earnings season, which once again, it puts more emphasis on the fact that the bonds are making some fairly wild moves and doing it on absolutely huge 
volume. And again, I want to reiterate this fact because earnings aren't necessarily moving the marketplace. We just continue to kind of grind to the upside on some very, very low volume, low liquidity. But at the exact same time, the bonds seem to be waking up again. And that's why I would pay, again, very careful attention to that. I also found uh, some other aspects interesting. So I'm talking about Goldilocks markets and the, or a wrecking ball of risk, and which is its own kind of dichotomy. But there's also this incredible dichotomy of opinion out there throughout the course of the week. And, you know, you see this kind of stuff all the time. But, you know, after, you know, Bill Wang blew up a few weeks ago, you know, I looked at obviously the onset of, uh, of Coinbase. Coinbase comes out. This is, again, it's not an IPO. It's direct listing is the, is the proper terminology for it. Kathy Wood went out and bought uh, $350 million dollars of this stock over a, uh, a two-day period. A lot of, you know, a lot of firms like she had 100 million, then she had 250 million. Ah, the full number now is about $350 million of this one stock spread across a, uh, a number of funds. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh man, how could she be so bullish on here? And okay, first of all, what else can she do? I mean, these are actually bullish funds. They're innovation funds. And pretty much any new issues that come out that could be bullish or innovative, you have to buy. You didn't necessarily have to buy $350 million, Kathy, but uh, it was good. So it's a very large, very, very bullish position inside of coin. At the exact same time, people like David Einhorn, which is um, you know Greenlight Capital out of uh, out of California, have actually come out this week and screamed about the markets effectively being broken, which is similar to what we've heard from the uh, you know obviously a couple of the uh, the people that run you know like Bridgewater Capital and so forth. And throughout the course of this week, you want another dichotomy of market opinion. Crypto uh, just seems like after Coinbase came out that it's gone completely and totally mainstream throughout the course of the week with several sovereignties discussing going into, uh, you know, uh, a completely digital currency out there. Yay. The only reason I'm throwing this out to you, okay, is not to point out, you know, this person's right or this person's right. It's again, it's incredible dichotomy of market opinion. And at this point in time, okay, I'll tell you this move to the upside, it's not so much. And again, I like to reiterate this because you know, if this was people just outright just throwing money at the marketplace, it would be one thing. And yeah, sure, Kathy Wood did throw some money, uh, some money at a uh, a brand new issue in the marketplace. Nevertheless, okay, this just reeks of just hedging activity and a grind to the upside. And the dichotomy of market opinion at this point in time, I literally block out. Okay, there's just one reality that I continue to kind of reiterate week in and week out when we're actually literally hitting all-time high, all-time high, all-time high. And we say that time and again, what is that, uh, you know, the market opinion over here? You push it aside, you realize at this point in time, if you're going to take that bullish risk, okay, do not let the wrecking ball hit you. If you're going to take that bullish risk on at, uh, at these particular levels, use spreads, use anything to define your risk. Because if we come off, we're probably going to come off in, uh, in quite a hurry over here, which actually brings me to none other than the VVIX as it continues its ascent. Here's one that's more, I got more questions on this one than answers. There was a huge VIX buyer Okay, literally back um, just a few weeks ago. So we're, we're about two weeks into it. This big, huge VIX buyer comes out. And since then, the VVIX continues to climb. We actually hit, uh, for those of you that do pay uh, a little bit of attention to this, what we call the Vama Zone. Vama Zone is anything north of like this, uh, this 110 region in here, which has, you know, in the past actually been kind of duck and cover, you know, get ready. Volatility is about to hit us. Look back over like the last three years and you'll see that uh, just recently, we actually hit that, you know, it's the low light of volatility. But again, what is the VVIX, all right? It's the volatility, okay, of the VIX options themselves. So if the VVIX is climbing, it's indicative of typically call buyers inside of the VIX, which is hedging activity inside of the VIX. And this one, again, kind of continues to resonate with me. Why? So you have the bonds going nuts and bond volatility up. You got the VVIX, you know, that continues to actually hover in and around what I call that Vama zone. And again, that Vama zone is indicative of, well, usually when we're in the Vama zone, it's, uh, you know, head between the knees and and uh, and go for it inside of the marketplace. And yet this marketplace just seems kind of what? Numb. And I think that's one of the best ways to describe it. And that's why I wanted to call it the Goldilocks market or a wrecking ball of risk. Last, but definitely not least on this weekend's update, I always talk about the SPX and of course the expected move. As I actually reiterated from uh, a little earlier, and I'm gonna reiterate right now, the, uh, the fact that the uh, edge of the expected move has been hit 
okay? In literally like, you know, week in and week out, we're hitting the upside edge of this expected move. In this next week of trade, the expected move drops to 54.43. Listen, that's a negligible, uh, just a negligible differentiation from the previous week. The previous week, as I said, was right around 60 to be specific, it was basically 58 bucks. This, uh, this next week of trade, you're looking for a $54 expected move. I think you should expect that and a lot more, okay? I think that uh, this next week, and again, this is purely the opinion-based uh, you know, trade over here. I think the next week of trade is gonna bring a little bit of two-sided trade. And as a, you know, as a trader, that's all you can ask for, all right? That is a bid and an offer. Uh, some two-sided trade though, and maybe volatility expanding to some degree. The uh, the area of contention, once again, is going to be the bond product. If the S&Ps are going to be making a move early on in the week, watch those bonds, people. Those bonds are probably going to be dictating much of the move inside of the S&Ps. Thanks everybody for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.